what attracted people to Jesus. And when all is said and done, you realize one thing. They're attracted to Jesus because he was a man of tremendous truth. They say nobody has ever spoken by, like this man. He was a man of great power. They said, what man of man is he? Even the winds and the waves, they obeyed him. And then he was a man of love. Can you imagine the person that was going to betray him? On the night of the betrayal, Jesus actually washed his feet. And John 13 says, he loved them all, including Judas, to the very end. A man of truth, a man of power, and a man of love. These were what attracted people to Jesus. And how many of you agree we all want to grow to be like Jesus? Ephesians 4 verse 13 says, Do we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ? What do we really want? We all want to grow to be more and more like Jesus. Now, I'm not an artist. I wish I am. (laughs) <laughs> but I'm not. So the best I can do is to draw a stick man. Now, Jesus, a man of truth, a man of power, and a man of love. So I've been reading books for the last few years, and one of the authors that I really liked was this man called J.I. Packer. And Packer, as a theologian and also as a pastor, he talked about what every church should focus on. He says that for every church, you must focus on doctrine. You must focus on experience. And you must focus on practice. In other words, how you live out what you believe. Doctrine, experience, practice. When we think about our church, City Harvest Church, What every church must focus on, sometimes we can focus so much on doctrine that we have become very unnatural in our development. This is like Stewie in a family guy. So strong on doctrine, you know, study, 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 getting into the Greek, the Hebrew, the commentaries, the history of it. And we do a lot of study and we, we never even give any attention to experience. It's not important, we say. And of course, hardly any active obedience or desire to fulfill the great commandment, the great commission, to be a blessing to the world, to make a difference out there in society. Now, on the other hand, there are some that are like this. Small little legs, big hands. Let me draw his hands a little bigger. Big on experience. All the time, it is another touch from God. We need to have another touch, a revival meeting. You no, know, we need to wait for the Lord. We need to have more prayer meeting, more revival meetings, revival, revival, revival. And very little on doctrine. And sometimes when you hear the doctrine, you get very shocked because, I mean, it's so weird. But they're just going for more outlandish experiences. And because they're so busy in revival meetings and having night after night of meetings and meetings, they have no time for the family, they have no time to, be a, to cultivate Christ-likeness, to be a better person. They have no time to be a blessing out there in society. Unnatural, unnatural development. Then you have those that have a small head, small body, but huge legs and huge hands. They are the the ones big on practice. Oh, all there is to life is to do good in society. You got to love with no strings attached. You got to go out there and make a difference. Go and make a difference. Help the poor. Reach out to the marginalized. Reach out to the needy. They They have no time to be to really focus on doctrine, and they have no time for experience. You know, they, their spiritual life is pretty dry up, but just a lot of doing, doing, doing. So again, unnatural development. Now, if our church become unbalanced in this, then we are not going to grow up to be like Jesus. So the important thing for all of us is to be balanced. What we want is to be balanced 
to be like Jesus. Turn to your neighbor and say, you got to be like Jesus. Doctrine, experience, practice. When you think about this, our job is to make sure that you are fed sound doctrine. Our job is to make sure every week when you come and every single day you live out the experience of your faith. And then we want to make sure that our behavior, our attitudes, they're all being transformed and we are witnesses for Jesus in our family and out there in the marketplace or in the campuses, right? What must we do personally? What must you do as a Christian, as an individual? You must grow in knowledge. You must grow in your spirituality. You must grow in your ethics. Okay, we want to grow in knowledge. Now, what does it mean to grow in knowledge? Now, the Bible says that he that knows that God will be strong and do mighty exploit. And really, knowing God and being known by Him is really the greatest pursuit of your life. I told son recently, every single day, I want to know God more. Because the more you know Him, the more you love Him. And the more you love Him, the more you want to serve Him. Remember when we were younger, we used to sing, the greatest thing in all my life is knowing you, is loving you, and is serving you. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Yeah. So knowledge is very important. Now, when it comes to knowledge, we are talking about the study of God over here. And we are talking about theology. Theology is the study of God. And there's a lot. The whole universe of theology is huge. You can spend your whole life or two, three lifetimes and you'll never complete it because our God is so great. Yeah. Our God is so awesome. And the more you know Him, the more you realize you don't know Him. Mm -hmm. And you want to learn Him, know Him more. You want to grow. You get more hungry and thirsty for Him. So there's so much to learn. Now, I'm a pastor. I'm not a professional theologian. I got to pastor the work and I got to fulfill what God wants us to do for our generation among our people. So as a senior pastor, as an elder, I focus on three things that's of great interest to me. Systematic theology, spirituality, and ethics. The three things I talk to you about. Now, in systematic theology, there's a lot. So just one thing is already a lot. There are 11 things you can look at and you can spend your whole life studying. I'll give you just one example. Patriology, the study of God the Father. Now, this is very relevant. It's not just studying history or theory. We live in a time where mental health is a big challenge. People are getting depressed, especially during COVID. You have panic anxiety, fearful of the future. So knowing God as the Father, I mean, how does the Father's love bring healing and wellness to our soul, to our mental health? See, this is a very big field. You can spend your whole life studying about this. My job. It's not to make you guys theologian. My job is to make sure that sound doctrine every single week is being fed to you, that you are able to have a balanced diet and grow to be a healthy Christian for the glory of God. And then you have the second responsibility is spirituality. Spirituality means your life with God. How do you live this life with God every single day? When we talk about spirituality, we are talking about seven things. So again, this is a job of our responsibility as spiritual leaders. We disciple the cell groups, disciple the church, and cell group leaders, you disciple the rest. Ministry leaders, you disciple the rest of the members. We want to grow in meditation, prayer, and worship. We want to be strong in faith, to walk by faith and not by sight, to be full of visions and dreams. And to be full of love because the greatest is love. Yeah. Then we've been talking a lot this one year, past year, on Christ-likeness and especially this past few months. We want to be more like Christ. We want to develop the fruit of the Spirit. And then we want to serve God and serve people because we are witnesses of Christ to our world. We want to live for Jesus and the gospel. Obedience is so important and serving His will. We want to suffer for Christ and the gospel victoriously, when we go through temptations, challenges, when we are going through hardships and difficult seasons, we want to overcome.
victoriously for His glory. And then glorifying God, you know, and uh, enjoying God. We want to live a happy and satisfying life. Living every day and making it count for the glory of God. So spirituality is our responsibility. Our spirituality is being informed by our knowledge. The more you know, the more spiritual you are. The more you know about God from the Word, the more you're going to enjoy your life with Him every single day. How do you live a life with someone you don't know? Yeah. This is our second responsibility. Third one is ethics. Now, ethics, what does it mean? It means knowing what is right and what is wrong according to the Bible. <laughs> Not according to what culture tells us, but according to what Bible tells us. Yeah. Ethics. Your a right behavior, a right attitude, and a right morality. Now, when you talk about ethics, above and beyond your personal life, if you have a conversation with our generation right now, they talk about four things. Society, relationships, bioethics, environment. They talk about issues like how to make our world a better place. Uh, what about issues like marriage and divorce? What about issues like gender, uh, equality, and, and sexuality? What about life and death, abortion, suicide? In the last few years, a lot of big questions people ask about suicide. And what about assisted suicide? You know, and the environment, preserving the earth, ethics. So those three things, if you want to be a balanced Christian, like Jesus, you got to be balanced in your knowledge, in your spirituality, and in your ethics. Have a right sense of knowing what's right and what's wrong. Okay? So our goal is to become more like Jesus. Till we all come to the unity of the faith, of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That is what we've been talking about. And that's why I want to share with you why I'm spending so much time. Since I've been out for 18 months, it's not because I have nothing better to do. But it's important that I help you in your doctrine, in knowing God more, so that you can become more spiritual. And then you can do more for the Lord to live a life that will bring Him glory. Before you can even be spiritual, your doctrine got to be sound. Now, what is doctrine? Doctrine is the set of beliefs and instructions based on our best understanding of the Scripture. We are not all-knowing. Only God is all-knowing. But God has left behind us a book called the Bible. It is His revelation inspired by Him. And we got to use our best understanding to make sense out of all that God has revealed to us. When we talk about this, every church and every denomination, especially a church like ours, we are not a small church. We've been around for 32 years. We have a sizable congregation. And we have 40 over churches that are, that are affiliated to us. And we, are, we have trained up 8,000 over Bible school. Just like any other denomination, we got to get our best leaders together so that usually the senior leadership the senior pastor and the key pastors, together with the theologians in the church, those in their, on their staff, those on their team that has been trained with theology, they come together and they formulate, all right, what are the things that we believe? The Methodist church, they have the Methodist doctrine. The Anglican church have the Anglican doctrine. Presbyterian, Baptist, they all have their doctrine. They are all trying their best. They're, you're applying themselves to understand the revelation of God, the purpose of God for their own people. Now, obviously, all believers are, are Christians. I mean, all believers are in Christ. Depending on our doctrines, we may have different spiritual convictions. But that's okay. Because, you know, that's what a church or a denomination, they apply the best understanding. That's what they they have learned and it being illuminated by the Holy Spirit. Our doctrine determines our DNA, our distinctive. 
Like in City Harvest Church, we have certain distinctives. Sometimes I meet people and then they say, oh, you know, Pastor Kong, I just met one of your members. I immediately, I knew that he is your member or she is your member because they have the City Harvest Kwan. Really, it's our DNA. It's our distinctive. Doctrine teaches us how to think about God and salvation. Like, how does God save us? How did He do it on the cross? To what extent are we saved? What is the purpose of saving us? Now that you are saved, how do you live your life? Now, you got to know. Doctrine teaches you on this. And then, doctrine shapes your values and your priorities. Our sermon is being preached based on our doctrine. So you got to know exactly what your vision is based on your doctrine. It affects our priorities. For example, what kind of staff we hire as a church? What kind of leader we, we select as a church? How do we invest our finances? Now, if your doctrine is to win the loss, you can be sure the evangelism budget will be high. If your doctrine is importance on family and parenting, you can be sure there's a budget for that. Priorities how we engage our society. And doctrine strengthens love and unity among members. Doctrine actually unites. All of us, we have a natural affinity uh, to people according to our age group. Young people like to mix with young people. Old people like to mix with older people. Or sometimes according to our language, all the Filipinos, they like to gravitate to a Filipino. We gravitate to people according to our language, sometimes according to our profession. Like the air crew people, they, they have an air crew fellowship. And they fly around so much, they fly together, they even like to worship together as a fellowship. <laughs> Natural affinity. But when you read John chapter 17, Jesus in the garden, and he was praying. And you learn one thing. Jesus knew praying for his church, natural affinity will never be the strongest foundation. The strongest foundation is actually the truth and the reality of God. So he prayed, Father, make them one, even as we are one, according to the truth of who we are. When you read the book of Acts, the early church did that. And in Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, they are all united under the apostles' doctrine. It is doctrine they will glue us together. Yeah. When you look at the early church, they're very powerful. How powerful? They have one mind, one heart. They are one soul. That means they felt passionate about the same vision. And then they even spoke with one voice. They are all moving as one. So powerful that when they prayed together, the entire building shook. So powerful. Signs and wonders were happening everywhere. So powerful that every day, People were added to the church. People were getting saved. And you know what? That's not foreign to us. The first 20 years of our lives, we experienced the book of Acts exactly the same way. So when you read this word, one accord, it appeared seven times in the book of Acts. One accord, one accord, one accord. Do you know this is actually a musical word in the original text? It's musical. It's not saying that everyone must be the same. One accord doesn't mean everyone must dress the same way, you know, uh, live the same way, like the same thing, have the same hobby. It's musical, like in an orchestra. Different instruments, making different sounds, but when they all play together, it's a beautiful symphony, and it makes beautiful music. Our church is very diverse. Different age, different likings, different hobbies, different jobs. We are people of diverse background, different education, different family background, different nationality, different experiences. But because we unite under common doctrine, we can do great things and see revival in Singapore and around Asia. Why is City Harvest Church a Protestant, Evangelical, Pentecostal church? Why is this important? You got to know our history. We started like this. This, this is the genesis of it. So we didn't start as a, any kind of church except this. Let's understand what does it mean to be a Protestant. In the world today, one in three people is a Christian. In the church world, among Christians, about one in two is a Protestant. 
Now, what do we believe in? Our distinctive is the five solas or the five onlys. Sola Scriptura, Scripture only. So we believe the Bible is infallible. We believe the Bible is a sole authority. Sola Gratia, grace only. Sola Fide, faith only. Solus Christus, Christ. Oh, by the way, all these are Latin words. So that is why you always hear me say, how are you saved? You are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. We believe in this. As Protestants, we don't pray to any saints, dead or alive. We don't pray to angels. We don't pray to statues or images through Christ alone. And it is soli deo gloria, for God's glory alone. When it comes to veneration, that means what you worship, what you adore, we are very careful. We only adore or worship or give honour and glory to God because only He alone deserves it. We do not venerate any human, dead or alive. We only worship God alone. Now, that's Protestants, and we are Protestants. Now, evangelical, among Protestants, two-thirds, are evangelical. We are a lot among the Protestants. We are the majority of the Protestants. We have four distinctives. Evangelicals are very loyal to the Bible. So we say the Bible is inspired. We say the Bible is infallible. It cannot fail. The Bible is inerrant. It's without error. We believe in all this. And we are very loyal to the Bible as a sole authority. We will only believe in anything if you can prove chapter and verse and give us a good reason. And if you can prove from chapter and verse that what we believe is unbiblical, we will change and we must change. If you can prove to me that what I believe is unbiblical, I will change instantly. Why? Because my loyalty is to the Word of God. Now, if you have that kind of mindset, you are evangelical. And we believe in the cross, in the penal substitution. Paul says, I come to preach Christ and Christ crucified. That's the big deal. This is our big deal. So Easter is very big for us because we are evangelical. We believe in conversion, being born again. We believe in community engagement. We mean, believe in doing good in the marketplace. So, if you have these four distinctives, you're evangelical. Turn to your neighbor and say, you are evangelical. What about Pentecostal? You just got to know this, Pentecostal. And Pentecostals, one among Christians, okay? So it's not just Protestant, among Christians. One in four is a Pentecostal. It's a Pentecostal charismatic. By 2025, one in three Christians in the world is Pentecostal. What do Pentecostal believe? Now, I emphasize classical Pentecostal because that's who we are. City Harvest Church started as a classical Pentecostal. Seven distinctives. Number one, this is important because you need to know, this, you need to know what you believe. We believe in the baptism in the Holy Spirit as a second blessing after salvation. We believe in speaking in tongues as the initial evidence of the spirit baptism. That's why in our church we speak in tongues. We believe in continuationism, a big word, but it actually means continuation. That means miracles are for today. When you look at all this, Pentecostals like us we are very happy and feel privileged that we can live out the book of Acts. That when we read the Bible, it's not just something that happened a long time ago. We are still living it, that the experiences of Acts is our experience every single day. Then our worship. I mean, we are Pentecostal church. So we lift up our hands, we sing, we have, we have a nice band, we have lights and everything. We believe 
the worship must be experiential. We don't feel bad about this. One thing to experience God doesn't make you shallow because you know why? In the Bible, the presence of God is tangible. You read from the Old Testament to the New Testament, the presence and the power of God. It's tangible. So this is a biblical thing. And also, in our worship, we believe that when it is experiential, it will deepen our love for God and for the worship of Him. Then that's why we love to worship God. It intensifies our joy for prayer and for praise. We love to praise. We love to pray. So Pentecostals, why is one of our favorite words? Praise the Lord. It heightens our awareness to the protection of God. When you're going through temptation, when you're going through periods of suffering, you know God will protect you. And worship is important. And it enhances our anticipation for guidance. So when we worship, we wait. We know that God is going to speak to our hearts. And then we expect God to bless us. Evangelism and missions. We absolutely believe in Acts 1.8 that you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Samaria, and to the outermost part of the earth. Evangelism and missions very important to us. So anywhere you go in the mission frontier, I can almost guarantee you it's been proven through studies and through research papers. Every time there's a mission frontier, most of the kingdom work will be done by Pentecostal people. Classical Pentecostal, almost all are Armenians. This has to do with predestination. We believe atonement is unlimited. That is why every Easter, every Christmas, what do you hear pastors say, or all of us? Jesus died for the whole world. Jesus is the answer. He died for the whole world. He died for you. Because we are Armenians. Atonement is unlimited. We believe God is totally sovereign. Absolutely. He's supremely sovereign. But God is also love. And in His love, He limits His sovereignty to give you and I a free will to choose to have a personal relationship with Him or not. And He's not afraid. God is so secure in His sovereignty. He's not afraid if you oppose His will. As Armenians, we believe faith comes before salvation. So what, what do we always tell our friends, our family members? Believe in Jesus and you'll be born again. When you say that, you're Armenians. Because Calvinists, they believe it's the other way. Salvation comes before faith. You get saved, then you can believe. But we always say that. This Easter, you're going to hear me say. And we believe in the second coming of Christ. We believe that there's going to be a rapture. All classical Pentecostals believe in the pre-millennial return of Jesus. And that when Jesus comes back, He's going to defeat Satan and the Antichrist and the false prophet and all the evil forces. And Jesus will set up His kingdom rule on the earth. And that's why we are so urgent to preach the gospel because Jesus is coming back. Clarity is important. You've got to be clear. If not, you're confused. You always love one another. You must. You must. Even if people doesn't agree, it's the same doctrine. Even if people of different faith, you must love them. And I have many friends who are Hindus, who are Muslims, who are Buddhists and Taoists, and I love them all. And we are friends. Some are close friends. Some I have known in the last few years. Some are our relatives. And we always love one another. Some differing doctrines cannot, cannot be combined. For example, Bible. Either you believe it's infallible or not. Either you believe it's the supreme authority or not. If you don't believe the Bible is a supreme authority, then it's Bible plus, plus, plus. Bible plus church tradition. Bible plus cultural relevance. Either you believe the Bible is the word of God. If it's the word, then you've got to read it literally. Or you don't believe the Bible should be read literally. The Bible is just a story about good and evil. But it's not really, really the word of God. Salvation. Either you believe salvation by, by grace or salvation by works. Or you believe salvation by grace, grace plus works. You cannot mix. So for us, we believe by grace only, through faith only, in Christ only. 
how to make. Then when it comes to supernatural, either you believe miracles will happen or not. We believe in Jesus' name. You speak in tongues, cast out demons, you heal the sick, you pray for them, and they'll recover. I mean, we believe in all this thing. Now, if you are not evangelical, the opposite of evangelical theology is liberal. Frederick Schulemacher, he was the father of modern liberal theology. Now, he's a German philosopher, one of the most brilliant men ever lived. Ultra, ultra brilliant. He wrote one book that became the textbook for a lot of government agencies for 200 years. He's super, super smart. He grew up in a very religious family and his dad was a pastor. When he went to university, something happened and broke his father's heart. He wrote to his dad, he said, I cannot believe that he who called himself the son of man was the true eternal God. I cannot believe that his death was a vicarious atonement. He lost his faith. And he came up with a system of study of modern liberalism, modern liberal theology. So if you are not evangelical, most likely you subscribe to liberal theology. There are five distinctives. Number one, the Bible is not the inspired, infallible. It's not inspired, it's not infallible, it's not inerrant. The Bible is not meant to be read literally. I believe as much as possible, the Bible should be read literally. God meant what He says. If you are a liberal uh, theologian, you cannot appreciate Easter because they say it's just a story. So in liberal theology, when Moses crossed the Red Sea, they say, no, no, no. He went to the Red Sea and there was one part that's only three inch deep. So that's how the Israelite crossed. It's only three inch. There's no miracles. To me, whenever I hear that, I say, wow. To me, that's even a bigger miracle because how do you drown an entire Egyptian army in three inch of water? <laughs> how do you do it, right? <laughs> yeah. And they believe in a social gospel. That means the gospel is not really about personal salvation. It's about doing good works. More important than loving God, because remember, even Shulamaka, he didn't believe that Jesus was God. The most important thing in life is to love your neighbor. That is liberal theology. 1966. I grew up as an Anglican church. I love Anglican authors. Two of my favorite authors is John Stock and J.I. Packer. And of course, I like Michael Green. Uh, I like uh, McAllister. I, I love Anglican uh, writers because they are so good in their, in their Christian faith. Joseph Fletcher, an Anglican priest, he wrote a book called Situation Ethics, The New Morality, and he started a movement started a move that is still running today. What happened? He's an Anglican priest, a pastor. He wrote this book, groundbreaking book. He said, there's no fixed moral values. That means when you read the Bible, don't take it seriously. In every situation, the most important thing to do is love. New morality, situation ethics. Because of this, what happened was in the 1960s and 1970s, his book in America launched a whole generation, millions and millions of Americans got into free sex and drugs. One reason is new morality, the teaching of his book. And what is really said, remember here was a man of God, a pastor, a man of God, but he became an atheist at the end. He died an atheist and he lost his faith. And that is the danger of liberal theology. Paul told Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 1, that what God has given to you, what God has entrusted, the gospel God has entrusted, you are to guard the gospel faithfully. You are to spread it actively. And you must be willing to suffer for it bravely. I will guard what God has entrusted to this house and to our leadership. I will guard it faithfully, spread it actively, and I'll be willing to suffer for it bravely. In Deuteronomy 29 and verse 29, it says, The secret things belongs to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that they may do all the words of this law. So you notice there are two things when it comes to doctrines. The secret things, things you don't know, and the things that are revealed to you. What God has shown you. 
what God has entrusted to us, our Protestant, Evangelical, Pentecostal heritage. It is meant for us. It belongs to us and to our children. And as a pastor, as a leader, I want to pass it to the next generation, to the next generation, and before I retire, to the third and fourth generation. And I hope that you too will pass on to your children because this is what God has given to our house. Now, the thing here, therefore, is to realize there are things you don't know. I tell you, I don't know everything. And I still stand corrected on some. So that is why even though I was, I'm out 18 months, I have many discussions, wonderful discussions with different pastors and leaders in our church. And we discuss on very difficult and deep issues. And then I learn. And some areas, I need to tweak a little bit. I need to change a little bit in some areas. So we must be humble because we don't know everything. But yet at the same time, we don't doubt. We don't doubt the plain, clear truth God has given to us. The strange thing here is this. Very often, it's the other way. We become proud. We think we know everything. And we doubt what is obvious. And that's a sad thing. So what is the goal of the church? Same verse. Do we all come to the unity of the faith? Now, notice it is the faith. It's not just, oh, you believe, I believe, praise God. No, it's not. It's the faith. What is this faith? The gospel. The gospel given to us. And the gospel given to us is a Protestant gospel, evangelical gospel, Pentecostal gospel. And to the knowledge of the Son of God, that's why I'm very keen to always teach you about Jesus. To the perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children. So Paul is saying this. Don't become children. So who is a children? When you are tossed to and fro, and carry it about with every wind of doctrine. It's very common these days because of the amount of information out there. You go on the website and somebody says, oh, oh, I'm confused, I'm confused. I believe in this. So you're not sure all the time. Paul says, you are an infant. You are a child. Because you, you cannot be certain. You don't have the maturity to settle once and for all what you really believe. Actually, this is a sign of the end times. Paul says, I know this, in the last days, perilous times will come. And one of the signs of the challenging times is that men will be lovers of themselves and give holiest of things. And then verse 7, always learning, but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. So should we be open-minded? I think being, having an open mind is very good. Especially when it comes to things that you're not clear. There are many things in life we are not clear. I, have ve- I'm a, I think I have a very open mind on many issues in the Bible, in the church, in the world, in society. Because many things, I don't know everything. And, and some things, the Bible itself is not clear. But when it is plain and clear for you to see, and you still say, hmm, I want to be open-minded about this then I think there's a real problem because you're veering towards disobedience. When something is clear and, and obvious and you refuse to believe in it, then that is unbelief. Being open-minded at that point is not a good thing. There are also practical implications. For example, when it comes to counselling, and someone comes to you and says, oh, please pray for my teenage daughter. You know, my teenage daughter is in trouble. She got a unwanted pregnancy, so I sign her up for abortion. Can you pray that God will bless the abortion and that the the procedure will be safe and everything will be well? What are you going to do? Are you going to pray? Oh, God bless that abortion in the mighty name of Jesus. Talking about praying, somebody diagnosed with cancer come to you. Oh, sister, sister, brother, brother, please pray for me. I'm diagnosed with cancer. But you don't believe in healing. You are a cessationist. You don't believe miracles for today. So even when you pray, because you don't want trouble, you don't want anybody to find out that you don't really believe, when there's no power in your, in your prayer. It's because there's no conviction. Ministering, Easter is coming, we're going to have a cell group event. Then somebody comes to you and say, I'm bringing my neighbor, can you please share the gospel to him or to her? What are you going to say? Are you going to say, you know, Jesus died for you 2,000 years ago. You can't. 
Because you don't believe he died for the whole world. He only died for a few. Or you want to say, if you believe, you can be safe. You can't because you're not an Armenian. You believe that you, are, you have saved us and then you can have faith. Can you see practical implications? It would be very complicated. Addressing social issues like gender and sexuality, social issues like abortion, suicide, assisted suicide, social issues like migrant workers, you know, and social issues like individual rights. Right? But I think before we address all these social issues, let's be very clear what the Bible says concerning all these things, marriage, divorce, life, death. Let's be very clear. And the Bible tells us, let's learn to be slow to speak. Because if we are not clear and we are not sure and we just join in the choruses, chances are you'll be part of the cancelling culture. I want to deal with the social issues, but I cannot deal with it when we have a church who are not as strong as we should be in the Word of God. Are we strong? We are quite, quite strong. Among the pioneers, quite strong. But I feel we got to get stronger in the Word. And that is why you notice through my social media, Instagram, Facebook, uh, Bible study, small group Bible study, church-wide Bible study. And sometimes I shock myself. I thought things I took for granted. Surely you know. And then I realize many of members don't. Before we want to deal with those social issues, let's get strong in the Word. Number two, our lives must match up. Yeah. I know you want to be a voice. I know you want to go out there and, and let the whole world know that you are with them. But make sure your life matches. Otherwise, when you falter and you stumble, how many lives will be devastated? I mean, recently, we, of the recent events, people that faltered and so many got stumbled and others get angry. I feel that what we need to do, cultivate Christ-likeness. And what is the first fruit of Christ-likeness? Love. Learn to speak the truth in love. Learn to, learn to be able to express an opinion without being opinionated. You know, there's a difference. I can tell you my opinion without being opinionated. You can be a judge and not be judgmental. Learn to speak the truth in love. Relationship precedes ministry. Look at Ezekiel. He was a prophet of God, speaking the truth. But before he spoke, he sat among the people for a long time to identify with them and build relationship with them. Talk about Jesus. 30 years he makes with the people before he started speaking to them. So make sure our lives measure up before you want to take up social causes and issues. Number three, you got to know our calling. Our calling is to win the loss, make disciples one soul at a time. The church exists to win the loss and make disciples. And that is our burden. Hot button issues, we actually have been dealing with this, just that you don't hear us dealing this on the stage. We have conversations in small group settings. It is not just more intimate, we can discuss it in depth, in detail. And we are able to be clear about many things. It is better in a small group setting than taking a loud hailer and shouting from the rooftop. Then you have more heat than light generated. And sometimes we shout so loud, people cannot experience our love anymore. Our voice drowns out our love and it defeats the whole purpose for why we even want to do it in the first place. Another wave of revival is coming. We have gone through two waves of revival. Just let me share this with you. You know, 1989, all the way to, uh, to the year 2001, we have one wave of revival. We grew from zero to 10,000. And then from 2002, all the way to 2010, we had another revival, right? And then we went through very hard time, 20. 11, 2010. Uh, 2010, all the way to 2020, including COVID-19, <laughs> all right? Tough times. So revival, revival. I sense another one is coming. But to get us ready for this, your knowledge, the doctrine, your spirituality, 
I got to get you guys up to speed. Get you guys up to speed because we have so many new people, not just new people from outside, our own children growing up. They need to know. They need to be discipled and trained and they need to be spiritually strong. Then the next one is coming and it's going to be glorious. So in preparation for that, pastor is never lazy. Pastor is busy working. You just don't know. <laughs> I've been having leaders discipleship. Leaders, and I'm doing a lot. In fact, the next two weeks, I have two retreats back to back. I know many of you are waiting, the young people are waiting for youth camp. I don't think it's going to happen this year, but I have retreats. <laughs> this retreat possibly is the most important thing I've done since I came out. Because all of us felt the power of God and the presence of God in a very real way. We all were saying, it just felt as if 1989, we're all starting all over again. And then our marketplace ministry, from April next, I've been meeting marketplace leaders. April next month, we, I'm going to start. We, first thing, start with Bible study. And then start with spending time with them. And we have big visions. We are talking, we are dreaming dreams right now. Hopefully, within the next one year, we'll get more people. This is COVID. It's a little hard. And I feel that the, sometimes the best platform is not always Zoom. So I want to meet. I want to be able to impart. So marketplace ministry. And then we talk about the youth. I'm so burdened. So Sun and I, we went on our silent retreat. And then we went on long walks and we prayed and we talked and we walked. And wow, one day the, the burden for the young people just came upon us so strong. Because you must remember, when I started this church, I was only 25. You will not find a single strand of white hair on my head. <laughs> and Sun was only 19 years old, a teenager, two of us, together with a few others. We started City Harvest Church. Now, it's time for a succession plan. Yeah. The next generation must arise. Yeah. And the next generation, I pray, you know, God will raise up in, among the 20s, among the 1920s, the teenagers, a new generation that's on fire for, for God. So we kind of feel this is a time for us to start a, a youth service, a first youth service, totally run by the youth for the youth. The musicians will be youth, young people, the song leaders will be youth, the singers will be youth, the TV people will be youth, the, the security people will be youth, ushers will be youth, greeters will be youth, the ones giving Bible study will be youth, giving announcement will be youth, totally run by the youth. Because that was our story. And we want to, to do it again. And we believe this is an important thing. So we talk to all the young people and then we say, we want to do this year. But then after discussions and all that during this COVID time, we kind of feel that the, the vision is right, the moving is right, but the moment is not yet. There's a moving and there's a moment. We said moment, January. Next year, we're going to start. Now, time for training, preparation. You're going to start seeing a lot of young people mending the machine, doing this, doing that, getting all busy. They're all ready for a big youth revival that's going to happen in 2022. Now, City Harvest Com uh, Community Services Association. I'm so excited. I met up with Kenny Lowe, and he's so on fire for God. And he's so spot on, so aligned with our vision. He said, why it's called City Harvest Community Service, Service Association? Because it's the City Harvest community, all of us. This organization belongs to all of us, for all of us to make a difference out there. Because our church have gone through a hard time. They also have gone through a hard time. But now our church is coming up again. So they are coming up again. We're going to hear more and more of this. What is the mission statement? I love this. Doing good in our communities as a social service arm of City Harvest Church. Remember 2020, 2010, we had our Asia conference and we shared with them all the big dreams and visions we're going to have. And then we went through tough times. Now this is remodeled, rebranded. They are refreshed, renewed, revived. And they're going to do even better than 2010. They're going to do even greater. And we are going to be a part of this because this is not them, this is us. Missions. We are so busy with missions. And from next month onwards, I'll be, I'll be doing a training with um, our THN churches, Leaders Discipleship, Marketplace Ministry, Emerge Youth, Singles, Family Parenting, CSA, Church Services, Cell Group. Don't forget men's ministries. Yeah. But big difference. We are not going to go back to the way we used to do things in the past. We want 90%. Let it be from God. Let it be God's effort. So don't be in a hurry. Don't be impatient. Pastor is very cool. I know 
what I'm doing, I know what God is doing. And I'm very happy and very relaxed. And I say, just wait and watch and pray and get ready for the glory of God to come among us. Hallelujah. Thank you so much.